<clears throat> Talking to you today about right of way. You can be right or you can be dead right. Let's understand the rules. Be a better, safer, smarter, and keep yourself safe. Right away rules. You can be right or you can be dead right. This is one of my favorite sayings about driving. And unfortunately, in the realm of driving, people believe that they're right. Driving is emotional. People get very emotional about when they're driving and they think that they are right. And unfortunately, they fail to give the right of way to other road users. And consequently, it often ends in... A crash because one person fails to give up the right of way a little bit and pushes forward so the number one reasons or the top three reasons rather for traffic crashes are following too close failing to give the right of way and speeding and we don't really buy into the speeding part of it because speeding is such a complex topic that we could spend two or three live streams talking about just driving but for the purpose of this tonight, we're talking about right of way, giving up the right of way and conceding to other road users so that you can prevent being involved in a crash. And that's what we're talking about tonight because the simple fact of right of way rules, they can be boiled down into three or four statements of keeping yourself safe. Major road over minor road, Straight through traffic over turning traffic and right turning traffic over left turning traffic. Those are the general right of way rules when driving. And then of course you have to pay attention to signs, stop signs, yield signs, traffic lights, those types of things. All of that is going to give you information about driving. So a few people here. Elevator fan is here. Hello my friend. Uh, yes, World Autism Awareness. And as well... Uh, we've had quite a number of awarenesses going on in the last few weeks and months and whatnot. Uh, Bricks for Wheels, Corey is the moderator, does an excellent job of getting up the videos I suggest you have a look at. Also does a good job at keeping out the bad people. And my friend Blessed is here. How are you, my friend? I mean, it must be really warming up there in Hawaii and being very nice in the spring. It's definitely very nice here. Temperature is in the high teens Celsius, which high 60s Fahrenheit. Uh, it's very nice here uh, in Western Canada in the mountains. So yes, so getting your license, passing a driver's test, becoming a safer, smarter driver, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. We can help you with all of that here on the live stream. So if you have questions, uh, leave questions down in the comments there. Leave questions underneath if you're watching on the replay and we can definitely help you pass a driver's test, become a safer, smarter driver, or start a career as a truck or bus driver. Ross, and it's your, your birthday tomorrow. Pre-happy birthday, my friend. It's going to be awesome. And uh, yeah, helping lots of people here. Lots of people are getting busier with spring and whatnot, and people getting their driver's license and driving now because people believe that they're safe. Because <laughs> winter's over, and people are terrified of driving in the wintertime because they think they're going to die in a fiery inferno after they crash into a tree or run over by a train, uh, which is nothing could be farther from the truth. The reality and the traffic statistics say that July and August, in fact, are the highest number of crashes uh, for this time of year. So we're going into summer, keep yourself safe, and as well, nighttime, four times as many fatal crashes happen at night as opposed to the daytime. And we were talking about this last week. We got off on a tangent and talking about drink driving Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights uh, after 9 o'clock. Uh, you are going to encounter drivers that potentially could be drunk, drivers that could potentially be high, and those types of things. So definitely take care uh, when you're driving those days of the week at night. Bus driver, how are you, my friend? Hello from Toronto. Hello there. And Mallory, my friend, is tuning in from the Maritimes. Hello, Mallory. So a few people here already. Uh, if you have questions, leave us a question. Uh, talk to us. Right away rules. That's what we're talking about tonight. Keeping yourself safe because you can be right or you can be dead right. <laughs> and probably one of the most contentious maneuvers for new drivers to learn is merging on a freeway, merging onto a highway. It gives them all kinds of fear and trepidation. We'll talk a little bit about that and give you some tips to keep yourself safe. Uh, Lone Wolf turning in from California. Hello, my friend. Uh, elevator fan says he's seen drivers uh, turning 
their signal on too early when they're turning and yes they do that as well and it confuses the drivers behind them when they're turning and unfortunately does not communicate effectively so you have to think about the distance that you want to communicate effectively about actually where you're going to turn or you're going to change directions of your vehicle because remember we don't just signal for turning and lane changes we signal every time that we change directions of the vehicle you want to keep yourself safe signaling and observation dovetail and work together and in case you miss something you're going to communicate effectively because driving is a social activity we all have to get along and if you make a mistake then somebody else may pick up the slack and help you out there and this is the reason why you may not be involved in a traffic crash because you put in all your skills and abilities and tools you signaled you shoulder checked you observed correctly and did what you needed to do to keep yourself safe and a comment left on the channel today uh, one new driver was saying that they passed the driver's license they got a demerit because they didn't shoulder check to the left and too many people are of the false information or have the false information that they don't have to signal sh shoulder check left because there's nobody there that's not true okay it's a backup <laughs> in case you miss the person that was there it's a backup okay develop the habits and skills that will keep yourself safe signal every time you change direction of the vehicle shoulder check every time you change direction of the vehicle as well the larger the vehicle that does not negate the fact that you still have to shoulder check you still have to move your head you still have to look you still have to shoulder check all right uh biro st Clair. hello my friend how are you Bus driver, that, that's why I always make sure someone is actually turning before I proceed. They may, may have turned it on too early or forgot about it. Yes, and especially when you're turning left out on from a minor road onto a major road and you're turning, sitting at the intersection waiting to turn left and there's a car coming to turn right. Before that vehicle, be, don't just pull out in front of that vehicle because they have their signal on. They may have forgot they had their signal on best defensive posturing is to wait for this vehicle to actually commit to the turn they actually start going around the corner before you pull out to do your left hand turn uh mallory communication with other traffic is key to safe driving absolutely good observation good communication effective com uh, communication the other way that we communicate is the position of our vehicle on the roadway if we're going to change lanes to the left we are going to hug the left side of our lane other vehicles are going to let, hug the left side of their lane. If they're going to turn right at an intersection, they're going to move to the right side of the intersection before proceeding around on a right-hand turn. The other <laughs> incorrect technique that I've seen people do in the last few weeks is when they're making a right-hand turn, they will button hook out. They, they, think it's, they think it's a button hook, but essentially what they do before they make the right-hand turn is they will swing left before they turn right <laughs> and you have to be very careful of these people because people behind them thinking the person is going to make a right turn will swing out to the left to get to go around the turning vehicle and then what happens is is the right turning vehicle moves left to get around on the right hand turn because they're incorrectly taught that they need to do that rather than swinging left to make the right hand turn to compensate for the off tracking because what they're doing is compensating for the off tracking they're compensating for the shorter path of travel that the rear wheels take what they need to do is they need, need to drive farther forward and then turn <laughs> rather than moving left because moving left eventually is going to get you into a crash and i'll tell you that from personal experience in a big truck uh, that's what happened many 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 years ago when i first started driving uh, making a left-hand turn into a service and uh, move to the right to make the left around the corner and of course the car tried to squeeze in between me and the curb and as I moved right without checking unfortunately uh, struck the car uh, that was trying to squeeze between me and the curb uh, lone wolf uh, how about when drivers don't signal at all yes they don't signal at all but the bigger signal that you need the bigger signs that you need to be looking for telltales is that what the vehicle is doing if they're going to turn right they're not going to signal they're still moving the vehicle right they're squeezing right it's subtle but the more experience you get the more you'll be able to pick that up uh, elevator fan i was always wait for the vehicles to start turning before i start turning yes and that's your best defensive posturing uh marion no i'm not 
I'm not ignoring you, my friend. Uh, I know you're poking at me here. Uh, Marion, hello, my friend. How are you? From Port Moody. There we go. Uh, Connor, make sure you always signal at stop signs when you're turning right and left. Yes, and every other time you change direction of the vehicle, make sure that you shoulder check as well and looking for those vulnerable road users. Uh, there was an article the other day uh, put out by one of the law firms that pedestrian and cyclists' uh, deaths and fatalities are actually on the rise in the city of Toronto. And they believe that infrastructure is going to fix this problem. The infrastructure is not going to fix this problem. We are still going to have vulnerable road users who are going to be killed at intersections and in the dark in these cities because... We are not convinced and we have not convinced drivers that driving is a social activity and they need to give up the right of way. It's the same thing with pedestrians. It's the same thing with cyclists. They need more awareness of the dangers around them when they're driving. How many pedestrians have we seen step off the curb and just walk across traffic and think they'll stop? Well, they don't stop, right? And it's you, 150 pounds or 180 pounds or whatever you weigh, 130 pounds, up against a, a, a 2,000 pound vehicle moving at speed, you unfortunately are going to lose every time. So there needs to be more awareness on the part of the pedestrians that they are not invincible. And unfortunately, this is too often what happens. And as well, the other problems with pedestrians and cyclists is they're inebriated. <laughs> <laughs> They're distracted on their phones and those types of things. And unfortunately, uh, mobility issues with older drive, older pedestrians rather, because they're talking about this. Uh, this was another segment of the population that was at high risk of being involved in a fatal crash as pedestrians is those seniors who are over 70 years old and don't have mo and have mobility issues and are unable to get across the roadway safely. Jackson, uh, three A's in a row. I need nine in a row to go for before I get my test tomorrow. Uh, Jackson, who is grading you? I never heard that before. Uh, Marion is doing well. That's awesome, Marion. Congrats. Uh, I'm glad. I'm happy to hear that you're doing well. I too am doing well. My cold is refusing to go away, but it's still here. Uh, two four seven. I passed my road test. I just haven't driven on an express highway yet. Any tips? Uh, yes. Maintain space in front of your vehicle. Uh, Corey will put up the video for you on merging onto highways, how to do that safely and keep yourself safe. And uh, just keep your space, uh, stay at the traffic, the posted speed limit, stay on the inside lane. Uh, if you're not good with congestion or you feel like congestion is going to give you anxiety and those types of things, go out earlier in the morning or go out later at night and all of that will help you out. Giovanna, um, intending to change lanes, so check mirrors and notice someone behind has their indicator to also change lanes in my intended path. Could I proceed simultaneously? Uh, so somebody's behind you. Is is it like two vehicles like this? You're This is a vehicle and you're a vehicle here and you're both going to move over at the same time and change lanes. Is that what you're doing? Uh, because if you're changing lanes and the person behind you is changing lanes, yeah, I don't see any reason, but I don't think I've ever really had that happen that I'm changing lanes with somebody else at the same time. All right, uh, let's get over to the presentation. We'll come back. The presentation is about eight or 10 minutes and we'll come back. We'll spend the remainder of the hour answering all your questions about passing a driver's test, becoming a safer, smarter driver, or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. So, Dead right driving, the right of way rules. I have the right of way, I'm not gonna give them up and I am going to proceed. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, hauled freight between Ontario, Canada and the United States, mostly east of the Mississippi, did make it out to the Western states. Only three states I haven't been in, Utah, Wyoming, maybe four states. Yeah, Utah, Wyoming, Nevada, and New Mexico. Four states. Yes, I've been wrong on this all along. I've been leading you astray. All right. Uh, drove buses for Greyhound, one of the regional bus lines in Australia while I was living there in the early 2000s. 1997, became a licensed driving instructor. And 2006, graduated from the University of Melbourne with my doctorate in legal history, which is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. Uh, 2015, he started the YouTube channel. It's been wildly more successful than I could have imagined. And we've helped thousands and thousands of people get their driver's license and become safer, smarter drivers. 
uh, and you can check out all the videos here and information. All right, good stuff to have a look at. Uh, driving anxiety uh, around post-pandemic driving. And of course, this was a year ago. So have a look at that video and as well have a look at the podcast on keeping yourself safe after you get your license. Social driving is one of the things that unites us as a human race, regardless of religion, politics, or race. We will, most of us will agree with the statement that I am a good driver. We need to understand that driving is a social activity. I call it, I coined the phrase social driving, and we all need to get along with other drivers on the roadway. And sometimes giving up the right of way, yielding to other roads is simply taking your foot off the accelerator. Too often people in... Social driving are reactionary and retaliatory. They follow too close, they stop too close in traffic, and they do not give enough room between themselves and other vulnerable road users. Most drivers who are participating in social driving are reactionary and retaliatory. And they're going to tell you in no uncertain terms what they think of you. They're going to honk their horn. They're going to give you the finger. They're going to be aggressive. Uh, if you are driving too slow and they're behind you, they're going to tailgate you to tell you that you were driving too slow. All right. Uh, follow too close. Stop too close. Give you the finger. Honk horn. Retaliatory. I just talked about all of this. Okay. They'll slow down in front. They'll flash their lights and will retaliate for your driving that you think infringes on their driving. And an example of this, uh, the road coming up to my suburb is closed and has been for a while and there's a roundabout and past the roundabout there's a no left turn sign but you can turn left there and go up the hill and come into the suburb. Now when the road was closed one day I did it and of course I got stopped, I had to stop to make the left hand turn and a vehicle behind me come up behind me and just like laid on the horn telling me what I was doing wrong. Of course, if I couldn't figure it out on my own, what I knew I was doing wrong. But this is what other people are going to do in the arena of social driving. They are going to police your driving. Okay, merging. Who has the right of way? The onus of responsibility when merging is on the merging driver. However, if possible, drivers on the highway will and may help you out. Not guaranteed that they're going to, but if you get up to speed, you signal, you hug the left side of your lane, they may help you out to get out onto the highway. Okay, speeding. What is speeding? I talked about this in the introduction. I try not to talk about speeding because it is such a huge topic and there are many, many different definitions of speeding. Okay, driving faster than the posted speed limit, driving faster than the traffic flow driving faster than me, other vehicles that are driving faster than you, and then finally driving faster than the conditions of the roadways will allow. So driving and speeding, speeding rather, does not lend itself to an easy definition of driving. All right, and this is why I'm reluctant to say that speeding is part of the problem when we're driving. Actually, what's, what is the problem and causes and leads to crashes is the mismanagement of speed and space. People's speed but also in, con in combination with that, they follow too close and don't give themselves a buffer of space. Okay, Reta reactionary and retaliatory. As I said, driving is emotional. People are going to crowd you, honk, they're gonna give you the finger and off sometimes road rage is going to eventuate because people are upset and they wanna tell you that they're upset and they wanna tell you that you are in their way. So emotional drivers. Okay, number of uh, th the top three reasons for crashes, following too close, failing to give the right of way, and I'm right, you're wrong. Okay, speeding, the mismanagement of speed and space are the reasons for crashes and failing to give the right of way. Good luck on your driver's test, and remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Evan, the stop line on the other hand will be, oh, okay, it's two part. At some intersections, there will be a giveaway line and at others, there will be a stop line. If it's too dangerous to continue without stopping, the giveaway will be open at, be at open intersections. Uh, Evan, we don't have good giveaway lines in North America, <laughs> okay? We either have a stop line at a stop sign or we have crosswalk lines. Uh, we don't have giveaway lines. Uh, in Europe, they have something 
uh, priority signs, which tells you which road has the right of way, which is basically indicates which road is the minor road and which road is the major road. For us here in North America, minor roads uh, usually have stop signs when they intersect with the major road. Zavala, any tips on a solid green light when there's no arrow to turn left? Uh, yes, uh, Corey put up the video for you on judging gap. One of the things that you want to do is, if you don't have a great deal of experience with driving, is go to the intersection and watch the turning vehicles and see how much of a gap they need. Most of the time you need anywhere from 8 to 15 seconds. If you're sitting to make a left-hand turn, depending how many lanes of traffic there are, to make that left hand turn. So you gotta start figuring how far away cars are and you gotta start counting 1,001, 1,002, 1,003 and you need to figure out that gap of how far those cars are away so that you can make a turn safely across that oncoming traffic and get to the other side safely. Uh, Marion, well a guy pulled out in front of a line of cars earlier and the car behind him laid on the horn and kept it all the way down the road, was crazy. Uh, yep, that's what people do, Marion. They will tell you in no uncertain terms that you did something wrong and they want to know that you're being, they're being heard. <laughs> so, and the other thing, uh, Sabala, is if you're making a left turn on a solid green light, if you are not comfortable going and you don't feel there's enough gap, don't go, okay? Because as a new driver, this is where they're going to get into trouble is making left-hand turns and you're going to get T-boned. So if you're not comfortable with going or you don't know how to judge the gap, then go with somebody that you trust, somebody as a mentor or hire a driving instructor and do a few lessons so that you can start making left-hand turns safely. Uh, TYSI uh, is TYSI. There we go. Is a three to five second following distance uh, in ideal conditions? No. And this is something that I think that a lot of people don't understand is three second following distance. Trust me, most of the cars on the roadway, if they are keeping a one second following distance, we're doing really well. If we could get everybody to do a two second following distance, we would be doing even better. <laughs> Very few people on the roadway are. I have a three second following distance. Now, the reason that we measure in time is because it's relative. It's relative. It's relative to speed. So the, the faster you go, the bigger that space gets between you and the vehicle in front of you. Uh, take, for example, at 50 kilometers an hour, Let's see if I get the numbers right in my head. No, 60 kilometers an hour. At 60 kilometers an hour, you are traveling approximately 18 meters per second. All right? 18 meters per second, which is like 18 yards. Okay? Uh, 3 times 18 is 30, 54 meters. So if you have a 3-second following distance at 60 kilometers an hour, you have a 54-meter following distance. Now, if you're going 100 kilometers an hour, you're doing 27 meters per second. And if you have a three second following distance, 100 meters per second, three times 27 is 60, uh, 60, 81 meters. So from 60 kilometers an hour to 100 kilometers an hour, your space between the you and the vehicle in front has gone from 58, if I remember my numbers right, 58 meters to 100 meters. So it's 58 yards to 100 or 81 yards, okay? So you can see that as your speed increases and decreases, so does that following distance. How do you know that you have the right following distance between you and the vehicle in front? Well, first and foremost, if you're using the brake to control space between you and the vehicle in front, you're simply too close. All right, you should be using the accelerator to be able to control that space in front of your vehicle. And being able to do that, you have to have at least a three second following distance. Otherwise, you can't control space in front using just the throttle. You're going to be on the brake all the time. And if you're on the brake all the time, you're going to be wearing your brakes out, requiring more maintenance. You're more stressed because you have to be on alert all the time. You are being reactionary to what's going on in traffic. And you simply can't drive like that with any, <laughs> any ability to relax and be on, have a calm awareness when you're driving. So... Three second following distance is perfect in all conditions of congestion, summertime, wintertime, those types of things. Now, as 
road conditions deteriorate, obviously you want to increase that. You know, if it's, you're driving in heavy rain or bad snow or those types of things, then yeah, four seconds. But the reality is most people on our roadways are following at a second. The good ones are driving at two second following distance. And the really good ones, like myself, I always, almost always have a three second following distance because I'm just using the throttle to follow behind other traffic. Uh, bus driver, I have my full bus license uh, with seven years driving mini coaches, shuttle buses, but I want to get trained on coaches uh, with my company. Any tips on transitioning to full size coaches? Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, any tips on transitioning? Okay, so bus driver, is have you approached the company and what, what has been the feedback from the company about you moving to full size coaches? Uh, Marion, find a fixed object on the side of the road and count 1001, 1002, 1003. Yes, that's how you do it. Absolutely, what Marion just said. The problem is, or the challenge rather, people don't do that. They don't, they don't count. <laughs> they don't count. And they certainly don't just use the throttle to control that space in front of their vehicle because we're in a hurry. we got to get there. Hurry up and go. Uh, Colton, your front end is directly behind a fixed object. You can leave three seconds after the rear of the vehicle in front of you. Yes, okay, that's how you measure it. Uh... Tox Fis, uh, I just watched one of your videos. Was wondering if you can explain what shoulder checking is. Uh, Tox Fis, shoulder checking is checking into your blind areas around your vehicle. So when you turn left, you're going to shoulder check left. Quick 90 degree turn of your head uh, so that you can look into the blind areas. If you're turning right or you're moving the vehicle right, you're going to turn that way. And Corey will put up the vehicle for you on shoulder checking, and that will teach you how to do that and give you instruction on that. So. Uh, drop us a note if you have any questions about that. Colton, if I was making an adequate cruise control system that can be retrofitted in any modern car that is compatible, the following distance would be three seconds at the closest. Too many people set it wrong. Yes, Colton, most people set it at two seconds. In, uh, most of the ones that I've had are two seconds, four seconds, and six seconds. Uh, six seconds is crazy. That's like so far away. Uh, four seconds is a little bit too much. If they had one for three seconds, that would be ideal for sure. Uh, Mary and I got the horn from someone behind me the day because I was not sure about turning left in rush hour traffic and the guy got mad at me. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it, Marion. Uh, don't take it personally. They honk at you all the time. They honk at me too. Elevator's back from dinner. Awesome. Have, that's great. Uh, Marion says everybody's in a big rush. Yes, they are. Uh, TYSI, I just finished my classroom time. I just have to do in car now. Okay, brilliant. Yes, so if you have a three second following distance when you're doing your in car, you're gonna be just fine, okay? And stopping back when you're in a line of traffic, stopping back one vehicle length from the vehicle in front of you, and your landmark for that is to be able to see the tires in front making clear contact with the pavement. Uh, Mallory, this morning I was shoulder checking from the passenger seat just to say I'd done it. Awesome. So let's talk about some traffic statistics and what we can learn from some tr traffic statistics. Uh, I've got some videos I'm making right now on truck crashes. <laughs> I love making videos on truck crashes because truck drivers get very excited because they always think that they're right. They think the, the general sentiment on, this, on social media is that if you post a video with a crash involving the truck driver, truck drivers automatically defend the truck driver. That it was the four-wheeler's fault, they're idiots, blah, blah, blah. And if you say anything to the effect that truck drivers are held to a higher standard of care and are responsible for other drivers on the roadway and that they could have done A, B, and C and prevented the crash, truck drivers will react. Does that sound familiar? Truck drivers will react. <laughs> and not in a positive light either. They will tell you without any uncertainty what they think of you, ask you what drugs you're on and where you last left your head. <laughs> truck drivers yes believe that they are right so they went and took the minimum number of hours of training that they needed to drive a larger vehicle and went out and started driving a truck and they think they know just because they're driving a bigger vehicle 
Uh, and I'll give you an example of that. There was a video on LinkedIn where the truck driver was in the inside lane, the van was passing, the truck had uh, bus mirrors, they're called bus mirrors, they're convex mirrors that sit up on the fenders and you can see all the way down both sides of the truck. I used to like driving trucks with bus mirrors because you had way more visibility on the truck. And the minivan's coming up, they're coming up to a, an off ramp and you can see it clear as day on the right side, you can see the continuity lines and even if the lanes were clear from the video, there was no way that the van would have been able to cut across all the lanes of traffic and make the exit. So the minivan comes up alongside the truck and then makes a lane change, makes contact with the front of the truck, of course, loses control. The minivan ends up across the front of the truck like this and the truck pushes the minivan off the road. Now, a couple of things, I, of course, I made a comment on it and I said, you know, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, the truck driver, had the truck driver been attentive, they would have saw the minivan coming all the way up the side of the truck, 75 feet. <laughs> You're talking five, six car lengths, 75 feet. What's 75 feet divided by 16 or 17? Is that like 5, 50, 35? Yeah, it's 15, 5. Yeah, it's four, four and a half car lengths. So they would have seen the, the minivan coming. Not only that, when the minivan started to move over in its lane, the truck driver honked. Well, I have an opinion that if you have time to honk in an emergency situation, you have time to do something else, which is going to be much more effective than honking. And what I mean by that is you get on the brakes or you swerve to, to avoid the collision. The truck driver did move right, but that was not the driver needed to the truck driver needed to both brake and move right so the van went past but the point is intersections so the first traffic statistic is is 42% of crashes happen at intersections more than 40% of crashes happen at intersections okay so the intersections of the freeway are on ramps and off ramps. That's an intersection. That's a transition from getting off the highway to being on the highway. And <coughs> as a professional driver, as any driver, people are getting on and people are getting off. And sometimes people do goofy things and they're going to do what I call the swastika lane change where they try to move from one lane all the way across three lanes to get off on the, off the on ramp. Now, I don't think that the driver was actually trying to make the off ramp. I think the driver made a mistake, didn't shoulder check to see whether the they were actually in fact past the truck because the truck driver honked and anybody who's making a lane change and just passed the semi trailer and the truck honks, you're gonna abort. You're gonna pull the steering wheel back to the left and abort the lane change because you're like, oh, wait a minute, the, the person honked and now I need to figure out what's going on. So that's often what happens uh, in lane changes. So I think because the minivan just kind of got halfway past the truck, like the, the, the minivan was kind of halfway past the truck and just drifted right over to the right, the driver either fell asleep or had a medical emergency. I don't think that they were going for the exit. It, they were way too close to the exit to even have made the exit because, you know, they were traveling at 60 miles an hour on an interstate. There was no way they were going to make it across. So, there we go. Uh, Mary and I just do not like uh, big trucks on the highway. Some of them drive really recklessly. Yes, they do. Uh, I'll have hand. I know tips for driving on highway. Uh, and I will be driving on the highway on Thursday on my way to Illinois. Excellent. Uh, Colton, truck drivers should be required to get their training for how to drive at a school attached to a workplace where they have to at least eight years of experience before they can go it alone. Uh, eight years is probably a little much, Colton. Uh, at least one year, six months to eight months is probably what they need because that's how long it takes to transition to that larger vehicle that they're driving. Uh, eight years is a long time. Uh, but um, yeah, they do need more training, that's for sure. And they've brought the mandatory entry-level training program into Ontario, uh, Alberta, here in British Columbia. Uh, it's coming to the United States. The issue with the mandatory entry-level training program is, is they did not put more seat time in for the drivers. 
They put more classroom time and more yard time. And this is not teaching truck drivers how to be better truck drivers. So this is what they need to do. Uh, they need to get the drivers more in the seat. And the other piece that Colton said that I agree with him is industry needs to get on board to help train these drivers. There needs to be more uh What's on the job training is what needs to be done. Unfortunately, the industry has more or less, uh, you know, hands off approach. There are some companies in the States that do train their drivers and do a very good job of it, but other ones that do not. And they do not, uh, you know, they basically, if you've got a, a tractor trailer license, you can get in a tractor trailer and, and away you go. So that's what they need to do. Uh, bus driver, hi, I have, uh, and they're waiting on getting trainers to train me. I'm just wondering if there's any driving tips you may have for driving coaches that may be different from mini coaches. Thanks, Rick. Uh, yeah, definitely some, <laughs> some different size for sure is your biggest, is going to be your biggest challenge first and foremost, because you've got to get the truck, the bus around, you've got to get it close to the curb and those types of things. So passengers can get it and get on and off safely. Uh, it's just like you said, they need to get trainers. Uh, if they can't get trainers, I mean, you do have a BZ license. You might be able to go back to a school, a truck driving school that teaches buses and be able to uh, get some training and just get used to the size of the vehicle. Uh, that's definitely going to help you out for sure. Uh, but um, more passengers, uh, those types of things. Now, when you say that you're driving coaches, what kind of work are you going to be doing? Is it like local bus driving work? Are you going to be taking tours, uh, running seniors to the casino, those types of things? What kind of work are you, what kind of bus driving work are you going to be doing with the coaches? Uh, Giovanna, what would, uh, who would have the right of way if someone is stopped at the side street with a stop sign waiting to take a right turn onto the main highway and another person is in the left lane? turn lane on the highway. Uh, it's always major road over minor road. So the person turning left from the major road onto the minor road has the right of way. But Giovanna, the person turning left and the person turning right, they can do those two maneuvers at the same time. They're not gonna interfere with each other. Okay, uh, opposite direction, waiting to take U-turn in the same lane. No lighted intersections are involved here, just a highway and an adjoining street. Uh, U-turns, Giovanna, I know that this is part of the driving culture in the United States. I am not a big fan of U-turns. Uh, I would rather go down and go around the block and come back uh, if I miss my turn rather than making a U-turn. Like I said, the reason I don't like U-turns, it comes back to this traffic statistic that more than 40% of crashes happen at intersections and you're making a complex maneuver at an intersection. <coughs> So this is why I, I'm not an advocate of U-turns at intersections. I have done them. I have been in places in the States where it's part of the culture, but I don't like them, okay? And for, it's for that reason of the high risk at an intersection. Uh, Lou K. Rick, I've seen you have been driving in, o in the Okanagan area uh, in your videos. Do you have any tips for driving in Kelowna traffic for new drivers? Uh, yeah, I have a few videos on that. Uh, keep your space. Uh, and do what you need to do to keep yourself safe when you're driving in traffic. Uh, keep that three to four second following distance. Try and anticipate the lights and, uh, you know, lots of shoulder checking when you're driving and uh, observations communicate effectively with other traffic and all that will keep you safe there in Kelowna. Uh, Colton, here in Arkansas, you have to go through class time before getting a permit. That's fine, but they also need to make them sit in the seat a lot uh, more before they have them turning uh, loose as ever considered. Uh, Colton, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, before they brought in the mandatory entry level training program, I think now the minimum time that they're getting in the seat is about 25 hours. Previously, when I was still teaching before the mandatory entry level training program came in here in British Columbia, we had a 28 hour course total. In that 28 hours, we had to teach them pre-trip inspection, how to drive the truck, how to turn the truck, how to shift the truck. Uh, so there's five components of a tractor trailer course, and I'll just go over those. So there's turning left and right through the city in a big truck that's 75 feet long. 
shifting, a non-synchronous transmission, pre-trip inspection, coupling, and backing. So they had to learn those five major things. And we had a 25-hour course. <laughs> In that 25 hours, you had pre-trip inspection was an hour every time they had a lesson. Uh, backing, coupling, uh, and shifting and turning. So shifting and turning. So in reality, out of a 28-hour course, they were only getting about 12, maybe 14 hours of actual in-seat time driving the truck out of that 20 hours. And then they were set loose with a license. And my Bill, who uh, Bill Walker, who I did some videos with while he was doing this years and years ago when I taught him how to drive, uh, he went and worked in the oil fields. And two weeks after he finished his training, he was pulling Super Bs, uh, which is two trailers behind a tra uh, tractor, a road tractor, uh, that weigh out at 140,000 pounds. And Bill had about 20 hours in the seat. And the reason I say this is that Bill came back two months after he would finished his license. He'd been driving a little bit in the oil field. And he wanted to take his dad for a drive in the truck. So the company said it was okay. So I went out with him. We took for a drive in the truck. And he was so proud of his shifting because the shifting was actually quite good. He got it down, but he still had not made the transition to driving a larger vehicle. His turns were not that good. And I said to him, I said, your shifting is excellent. I said, you can forget that for now. And I said, just work on getting the vehicle around the turn, around the corners safely. I said, because you need to take up more space. You need to do this. You need to do that. And those types of things, right? Uh, Corey, I may not fully understand the scenario here, but legal U-turns versus someone on the side street with a stop sign. Pretty sure the U-turn would have the right of way. However, like Rick is saying, U-turns are fairly risky. Yes. Okay. Uh, that can happen is aggressive drivers will ignore traffic signs and right of way. Saw this yesterday when I was heading to Newark. Uh, try to hold back to deal with aggressive drivers. Yes. And sometimes you just have to let them go and ha do, you know, have their crash somewhere else because that's what's going to happen. Uh... Colton said the only reason I would make a U-turn would be for a legitimate medical emergency if I know where the hospital is with 95% uncertainty or better. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, bus driver, it's mostly charter and tours like Toronto to Niagara Falls, for example, and corporate charters from hotels, airports to conventions. Okay. Yeah, so essentially bus driver, you just have to get <coughs> excuse me, used to the larger vehicle from minibuses because minibuses are basically a big van, right? It's a 15 passenger van that you're driving around, but highway coaches, you know, 50 passenger highway coaches, they're pretty big. And one could even make the argument that they're harder to drive than a tractor trailer because they don't have an articulation point, right? And we drove, when I was in Australia, they were 14 and a half meter, uh, 14 and a half meter uh, buses, 14 and a half meters. I'm trying to do the math in my head. Three times 15 is 45 feet. So they were 45 feet long and they don't have that articulation point. So you need a lot of space to get them around corners uh, when you're trying to get around corners and those types of things. So driving the tour buses and those types of things, really great. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it's going to take a bit of a transition from the smaller to the larger vehicles for sure. Uh, elevator will be in the Chicago area on Thursday. Any good tips for dealing with rush hour traffic? Uh, elevator fan, yes. Keep your space in front. You can protect that space in front. You're going to keep yourself safe. And uh, I was doing a video in talking about Kelowna. We were talking about driving in Kelowna earlier. And I was doing a video in that. And, you know, don't get in a hurry. Uh, I was trying to go through Kelowna from all the way from the university to the bridge. Uh, it's about seven miles of bumper to bumper, rush hour traffic, congested. It wasn't bumper to bumper, but it was congested. It was heavy traffic. And I was behind this semi truck and I finally got out and passed the semi truck, went across the bridge and I thought, oh, okay, we'll just stand here. We'll just sit here. We'll stop. We'll wait for the truck to go by on the bridge and we'll see how, how much time we made up passing the truck. <laughs> and by the time I got stopped and I started the counter, uh, the truck went by 30 seconds later. So we didn't really make that whole much much time after we passed the semi-truck uh, in town in congestion. So if you're in congestion there in Chicago, just take your time, keep the space in front, keep yourself safe, and uh, you'll do great. And if you're changing lanes and those types of things, make sure you do your shoulder checks, make sure you got your space, 
communicate effectively using your signals and those types of things. Uh, bus driver, you are most welcome, my friend. Uh, Mallory, do you have any tips or videos for those who are learning how to drive buses? Uh, I don't have a lot of videos on learning how to drive bus, Mallory. I need to do some of those, but part of my challenge is getting equipment to be able to do these videos. Uh, but, um, you know, like I said, it should be pretty easy because bus driver has been driving minivans and those types of things. So he's already got the, um, customer service aspect of it down, dealing with passengers and those types of things. Now, the other piece, uh, bus driver, I will just say this, and this comes from my crash analysis work that I do with, uh, transit buses and whatnot. Keep in mind that you have a higher duty when driving a bus and being a bus driver. One of your duties as a bus driver is you have to facilitate the transition of passengers to pedestrians and, and vice versa, passengers or pedestrians to ped passengers rather. What I mean by that is places where you stop and they get off the bus, it has to be safe for them to get off the bus. Okay, and you need to think about that because sometimes when you're driving buses, people will want off the bus at places that are not designated stops. And you need to make a decision, if I pull over here, is it going to be safe? <coughs> Excuse me. Is it going to be safe for this passenger to get off the bus and be a pedestrian? Okay, and... One of the things that I will talk to you about that, an example of that. So say, for example, that there's a, a, it's a transit bus and there's a bus shelter there. But the bus driver decides because the passenger's nice and they chatted up and then she rides the same bus every day. And she's like, oh, can you drop me two blocks up the road? The bus driver says, yeah, sure, I can drop you up the road two blocks up from where the, the bus shelter is. Drops the passenger off drives away the passenger standing on the side of the road somebody swerves off the road and hits the passenger now i'm talking worst case scenario here you can be held liable for that because you did not drop the passenger off at the bus shelter so know that that you have to make sure that where you're dropping the passengers off is going to be safe because you have a responsibility to facilitate that transition from Passenger to pedestrian and pedestrian to passenger. Uh, Marion, TransLink won't let passengers at random places, only at the bus stops itself. There you go. Exactly. And there's a reason for that because, unfortunately, they've had, they've been sued for that. Okay. Uh, my friend Sam is here. Hello, Big Mac Sam. How are you, my friend? Uh, Emily could get some more space. And then as I move up to the create space, they keep coming closer and closer to me, essentially, with each time I move up. And away from the inch up closer to me. Uh, Emily, what is your advice for a person constantly edging up behind you? I always keep a full car distance between myself and the car in front. And when people come up too close behind, I edge up too. Uh, Emily, <laughs> I, I know that people talk to me about this all the time. They talk about people tailgating them. I think that you are being overly concerned about what people are doing behind you. Okay? My suggestion would be for you to focus on what you're doing. Not what they're doing. Focus on what you're doing. Keep the space in front. Do not compromise that space in front of your vehicle. Okay? Don't give it up. Okay? Because if you move up, they're going to move up. Okay? Let them go and have their crash somewhere else. Focus on what you are doing. Not what other people are doing. If they're too close, that's their big deal. I'm not saying that be completely oblivious to what other people are doing behind you. And I'll give you an example of this. Last week when I was shooting the video, I was making a right turn off the major highway and you kind of come down a hill and around a curve and there's a right turn there. I had my signal on lots of time, but I saw the car behind me was way too close to me and had I not kind of kept going and got off the road when I did, there was a good possibility that they were going to try and park in my trunk. You need to be aware of what the vehicles are doing behind you but don't be influenced by what they're doing. Do not give that space up in front because when they're tailgating you, that's what you need is more space in front, okay? So that you can drive your vehicle and drive for them too. But try not to get sucked into getting your focus taken away and concentrating on what they're doing. Try and focus on what you're doing when you're driving. Uh... 
Eddie, uh, I'm just ha not having to remember I'm not a moderator here, but I'm a mod for another channel, which I'm a daily while well, awaiting MRI results. Awesome. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Excellent. We got everybody. Epic. Epic, I wonder if it's illegal for truckers to actually go to the leftmost lane. Saw this yesterday on I-78. If you were to get into an accident with a car, who would be at home on the left? Uh, Epic, if it's more than three lanes, no. Big trucks are not allowed over in that left-hand lane. Now, of course, big trucks will argue with you, truck drivers. Uh, I put a video up, <laughs> video short, uh, three lanes coming up the hill at a windfield here in the Okanagan Valley and said, you know, what is the truck driver doing out in the left-hand lane? They, they shouldn't be in the left-hand lane. And yes, uh, and I have been pulled over. I was pulled over years ago in the state of New Jersey for being out in that left-hand lane. So no big trucks cannot be out in that left-hand lane. And actually in the CB vernacular, it's called the bumper lane, which is the right lane, the uh, fast lane, which is the center lane, and then the big dollar lane. And the reason they call it the big dollar lane is because big trucks can't be out there and you're gonna get pulled over for being in that lane. So no, big trucks can't be in that lane. Uh, Mary and I had a woman behind me yesterday waiting at the traffic lights. Uh, was really close behind my inch forward, so she did, uh, except she was texting on her phone. Yes, and there's no point moving forward to try and get more space between you and the person behind you because the person behind you, as Mary just said, if they're on their phone and they're texting, they see you move forward, then they just inch forward too. So don't give up that space in front of your vehicle because that's what's pr protecting you from them rear-ending you. <coughs> so, focus on what you're doing, not what the other goofy person is doing, all right? Uh, Eddie, yeah, been suffering what really bad ear pain and no one knows why, but I do have impacted wisdom teeth. One is just set the nerve, but the other intense pain. Okay, sorry to hear about that. Uh, Sam, what part of New Jersey was that, Rick? I was on an interstate, Sam. <laughs> I don't remember. I, I, the only thing I do remember is that I was going west out of New Jersey. And I recall it because it was a state trooper and he gave me a lecture. <coughs> Excuse me. He gave me a lecture saying that everybody on the CB radio was talking about him sitting there and there was a bear trap. And I said, I turned the CB off because I was listening to the other radio. I was listening to music on the radio. And he stood on the sideboard for about 20 minutes giving me a lecture about how I should drive and that I should not be in the center lane and those types of things. Personally, I think he was bored. And then finally he just gave me a warning and off we went again. But it was pretty funny. That's why I remember it. The state trooper asking me why I didn't have my CB radio on. So, yeah. Uh, Eddie, it's being sorted. So hopefully it uh, will be sorted soon. Awesome. Uh, Savala, uh, advice on becoming more defensive as a driver. All right. So four components. So we already talked about social driving being reactionary, retaliatory. The four components of social driving. Space management. Okay, have that three to four second following distance in front of your vehicle. Use the throttle to control space in front of your vehicle. You can control that space in your front of your vehicle all the time. Speed management, understand the different speeds of road user groups, different road user groups on the roadway, okay? You're traveling at 30 miles an hour in the city. A bicycle is probably traveling at 18 miles an hour. Pedestrians are traveling at five or six miles per hour, depending on their ability, mobility, okay? So understand all that when you're driving. Communication observation. So communicate effectively when you're driving. Position of your vehicle on the roadway. Uh, lights and signals. Get eye contact. Hand gestures. Uh, use all five fingers. Don't tell somebody they're number one when you're driving. And then observation. You need to have a forward scanning pattern in place when you're driving. Far down the road, in check your instrument panel. Far down the road, mirrors. Uh, far down the road, check your side mirrors, your wing mirrors. And Repeat that every 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, when you're changing lanes, changing directions of the vehicle, shoulder check, shoulder check, shoulder check. All of that is going to make you a safer, smarter driver. And then finally, when you're reversing 360 degree scan around the vehicle, looking out through the back window, backing up, use a backup camera, use your mirrors, use all your tools when you're reversing. But observation and communication work together 
uh, in tandem. All right, uh, when you're driving, all of that will help you out to be a safer, smarter driver and be a better defensive driver. All right, uh, Colton, it's an aftermatter exhaust kit that sounds really good. Has a 2014 Challenger with one of those kits, and it sounds amazing. Awesome. <sighs> okay, modified exhaust and those types of things on your vehicle. So we're talking about better defensive driving. We're talking about giving up the right of way. Top three reasons for crashes, as we talked about, failing to give the right of way, following too close. We know that people follow too close. We know that most people follow at a one second following distance because the number one crash in North America is rear end crashes, more reported to insurance claims than even windshield damage, okay? <laughs> so people running into the vehicles in front of them, you have to have that space in front. Space gives you time, time gives you options, options prevent crashes, and that's what you need to do. However, you need to go against what everybody else is doing in the driving environment. Everybody else is participating in social driving, too close to other traffic, and they're being reactionary and retaliatory, okay? They're hoping on a wing and a prayer that they can get their foot on the brake fast enough and get their vehicle slowed down, when somebody else in the driving environment does something. We want to move from being reactionary and retaliatory to being proactive and predictable on the roadways, which is going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. Eddie, I've got to go. Uh, good seeing you again. Lovely to meet you. All the best. All the best, Eddie, and take care, my friend. Okay. Uh... And again, if you're waiting at the traffic light and somebody is too close behind you and you're trying to move up, uh, you gotta protect that space in front. Don't creep up because they're just gonna creep up behind you as well. The other piece with social driving is there's a lot of people sitting at traffic lights, they're distracted. They're looking at the radio, they're changing the radio, those types of things. And when they see movement of other traffic, they're gonna try and go. And I'm guilty of this as well. And... <laughs> Uh, just a week or so ago, I was driving with the kids in the car and come up to a light and I thought there was an advanced green and started to go through the intersection on the solid green light. And then I got, you know, a full length car length out into the intersection and realized, hey, wait a minute, I can't turn left. I have to give way to the oncoming traffic. I thought there was an advanced green. And in fact, there wasn't an advanced green. So sometimes you got to check, double check and make sure that in fact you do have the right of way. And that's what we're talking about here. Other times you're just going to have to take your foot off the throttle really quickly and say, and put your foot on the brake and <laughs> stop and hope that other traffic moves around you and those types of things to keep yourself safe when you're driving. Uh, Colton, and do not drive while playing with, uh, yes, all that stuff. Uh, Mallory, great live stream. I uh, love all of the tips from tonight's live stream. Thank you so much, Mallory. That is awesome. Always great to see you here and tuning in. All right, I think we're going to leave it there for tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, you're watching on the replay, leave a comment down in the comment section there. Uh, Sam, I hate it when they do that. I uh, second following distance, I say to myself, I can just slam my brakes and they will be right on top of me. Yes, so you want to try and keep that space in front. It also works for tailgaters because now you're driving your vehicle and driving for the vehicle behind you. So. Uh, Dixie, I was driving the other day and some weirdo flashed his Johnson at me. Okay, crazy people out there for sure. <laughs> Jaden, <coughs> long time no see. I'm just completely stressed out and not having a good day at work. Uh, one of my flatbeds, the toolbox door fell off. Uh, that does not sound like fun. <laughs> Elevator fan, no. Uh, Striker does not play fetch, but Easy Bear does. So, yes, lots of fun there. Uh, Marion, you are most welcome, my friend. All right, we'll leave it there for tonight. Uh, if you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations. Uh, if you have a test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, you have any questions at all, comments down in the comment section. Hit that thumbs up button. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.